One problem with the evidential argument is that it's based on arrogance. It puts finite, flawed human beings in the place of an infinite, perfect God and then declares that nothing makes sense. But just because we can't see the good that results from a given situation doesn't mean there is no good. Human beings don't have an exhaustive knowledge of all the workings of the universe and therefore can't determine how much evil is required to bring about a particular good. The evidential argument is ultimately grounded in the selfishness and short-sightedness of human beings. Another problem that the evidential argument faces is that it loads the question to be answered a certain way. If someone makes the claim that all the evil we see in the world, genocide, rape, torture, slavery, disease, injustice, terrorism, and so on, makes it likely that God doesn't exist, then they have their thumb on the scale. Taken as a statement in isolation, this argument might have some force, but to bring forth the evidence for evil and leave the evidence for God unstated is disingenuous at best. Probability is calculated by the relevant background information. We all know quite a lot about evil and can easily rattle off a long list of examples. Our personal experience and observation of the world make up the background information we use to be able to speak about evil. But the same consideration must be given to the arguments for the existence of God. We can't just place the idea of God unexamined on the other side of the scale. The background information that's relevant to this question contains much more than just evidence for evil. And in this background information, we find the cosmological, design, and moral arguments for the existence of God, that the God described by those arguments is the God of the Bible, and that the Bible is a trustworthy document both in terms of its manuscript authority, authorship, and content, that God reveals himself to humans through prophecy which are verified by miracles, that the resurrection of Jesus was an actual historical event that authenticated Jesus' claim of divinity, his message of salvation, and his ability to reveal the will of God. It's against these considerations that genocide, rape, torture, slavery, disease, injustice, terrorism, and other evils must be weighed. And given this background information, the weight of evil is shown to be no match for the overwhelming evidence for the existence of the God of the Bible. The most powerful way to respond to the problem of evil is not, however, to place various kinds of evidence on both sides of a scale. Rather, there's a more fundamental issue that has to be addressed when using the terms good and evil. When someone speaks of evil, what are they actually saying? For anything to be called good or evil, we must first recognize that we're not talking about preferences. When things are declared to be evil, we mean that something ought to be a certain way, but is not. We mean that there is a violation of an intended order and that its purpose is not being achieved. But where do things like intention, order, purpose, and oughtness come from? They come from a person, of course. And since we're talking about intentions and purposes that are universal and transcend individual human beings, cultures, and times, these intentions and purposes must come from a transcendent source. This source must be a person that has the power to impose his will on the world and has the ability to enforce it. This person is who we call God. Good and evil, therefore, find their reference point in the person of God. If an act or event is evil, then it's because it diverges from God's moral will. But this claim is often challenged. Critics point out that either God is conforming to a standard of goodness outside himself, or that something is good just because God says it is. Either way, we see a God that does not deserve our obedience and worship. After all, if a thing is good just because God says it is, then we're saying that might makes right. And if there is a standard of goodness to which God is obliged, then it's to that standard that we are also obliged. This apparent flaw in the logic of Christianity has given justification to many people wishing to avoid the God of the Bible. But there's a third option. Goodness finds its source in God's character, and the standard of goodness is God's character itself. Things are not good just because God says they are. They're good because they correspond to his perfectly good and unchanging character. God's intentions and purposes are strictly informed by his character. The degree to which something does not correspond to God's benevolent character is the degree to which that thing is evil. The point is that to say something is evil is to say that there is an objective, transcendent personal being whose will is violated or whose order is being disturbed. 
In other words, to say something is evil is to claim there is a God. In fact, the existence of evil is one of the most powerful evidences for God. Without the existence of God, the idea of evil becomes unintelligible. As a result, the problem of evil is not a problem for the Christian. Rather, the problem of evil is a problem for unbelievers. We've seen how God could allow evil and that the existence of evil is compatible with God's character. But if God is all-powerful, omniscient, and perfectly benevolent, why doesn't he just destroy evil? The answer may have to do with our moral character. Because we're made in the image of God, human beings have the ability to make choices that have a moral dimension to them. This ability, of course, allows that we can choose the wrong thing and, as a result, introduce evil. For God to destroy evil, he must take away the ability of his creatures to introduce evil into the world. But to do that, God would also be destroying the ability to do the greatest moral good as well, and that is to be able to love. Instead of being destroyed, evil needs to be defeated. Perhaps the greatest difficulty of the answer to evil is that it doesn't provide a great deal of comfort for those in the midst of evil and suffering who have never thought through the issue before. Although the answer may be intellectually satisfying, it often fails to provide a real comfort for those who are suffering and asking why such things are happening to them. In fact, to give this answer to those in crisis can come off quite cold and uncaring. It could be completely inappropriate to respond with this answer at certain times. The proper time to explore the problem of evil is not in the midst of suffering. This question is best answered before such situations arise, and they will arise. If the answer is understood beforehand, then it provides a framework to understand, at least to some degree, why things are the way they are. It also gives assurance to the believer and buoys them for their journey. It strengthens faith and can be used to reveal God to unbelievers brought in contact with suffering believers. The main answer, however, to the problem of evil is the person of Jesus. Jesus took the moral evil committed by those who believe in him and paid the penalty for that evil on the cross. And Jesus will sit in judgment of the moral evil committed by those who don't believe in him. Either way, moral evil finds its remedy in the perfect obedience of the life of Jesus and his death on behalf of those who believe in him for the payment of sin. He will either judge or justify every person who has ever lived. Jesus is also the solution for natural evil. In his resurrection, we see him not just restored to his physical body, but to a glorified state. His resurrected body can't die, get sick, or be corrupted in any way. Jesus' resurrection is a glimpse of the world to come. It is clear and even tangible evidence of the fulfillment of God's good purpose that he is bringing about. This demonstration gives an answer to those who are suffering from physical or natural evil. The blind shall have their sight restored. The deaf shall hear. The crippled shall walk. The mentally handicapped shall think clearly. More than that, there will be no more tsunamis to kill thousands of people. No more hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, sickness, or disease. All things will be not just restored to their state before the fall, but will attain the good purpose for which they were created. Jesus overcame both moral and physical natural evil. He alone is the solution. Evil is only a problem for those who refuse him.